All right, so in our, in our series uh, so far on Jesus, the King of the Kingdom, we've kind of worked our way through uh, the book of uh, Matthew, observing Jesus, the King, as He is establishing his, uh, his kingdom. And most recently, we've seen how He has built up His apostles to the point of faith in Him as the divine Messiah. You know, they, they saw Him as their leader, they saw Him as their teacher, and uh, in our last lesson, we saw how he was building their faith up to the point where they recognized that he wasn't just a teacher, not just their leader, but actually the Messiah himself, the divine Messiah. And we've also studied his lessons about the kingdom and who can enter and who is considered great in the kingdom and so on and so forth. So far, the trajectory, as we've seen, has been on an upward swing in his ministry. He's popular. You know, big crowds, people wanting to see him, so on and so forth. And then we saw that with the death of John the Baptist and Jesus' own you know, beginning rejection in Nazareth, the downward spiral in his ministry begins, which ultimately, of course, leads to his death. And so in today's lesson, we're going to read about a young man who will typify the greatest loss to the kingdom. And that's why today's lesson is entitled, uh, the, Kingdom's, the Kingdom's Loss, Matthew 19. I want to give you a little background here uh, in order to set up uh, our uh, lesson today. By this time, Jesus' ministry in the northern part of the country near His hometown in Galilee is completed and He prepares to travel towards Jerusalem, a journey of about 70 miles or so. Now Matthew divides his description of events into two sections. Uh, events that take place while Jesus is on His way to the city, and then the events that take place in and around the city of Jerusalem itself. Now the general acceptance and the mild doubt expressed in his home region are replaced by aggressive attack and total rejection as he nears the city. So there's really a change in tone that is going to take place here. In the section where Jesus is traveling, Matthew describes a lot of different encounters that the Lord has with you know, different people. For example, the healing of the crowds, uh, the discussion with the Pharisees uh, about divorce, uh, the blessing of the children who come to Him, the ongoing discussions that He has with the apostles, and the blind men receiving their sight. All these episodes Matthew describes as they're traveling to Jerusalem. But none of these episodes is as poignant and sad as the one that Jesus has with the rich young, the rich young ruler. Uh, and that section begins in verse 16. So let's take a look at that, shall we? Matthew 19, beginning in verse 16. It says, And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, why are you asking about what is good? There's only one who is good, but if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? And Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. So I said the title of this lesson is The Kingdom's Loss because of this man right here. He was young, he was successful, pious, headed in the right direction, asking the right questions. He was searching for the kingdom, but fell short because there were certain things that were missing in his life, missing ingredients, if you wish. In the end, he loses the thing that he thought he wanted, and the kingdom loses a potential soul at this point. So as we review the story, let's pay careful attention so we ourselves do not suffer the same loss of the kingdom as this man did, because you know, we're going to see some of ourselves in him to a certain extent. 
So our lesson today is going to center around the things missing in his, in his life. Well, first of all, the first thing missing in his life was faith. The young ruler really didn't have faith. He had good intentions, but not faith, and the passage demonstrates this in several ways. For example, he doesn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah, but rather as some kind of teacher. By referring to him as good teacher, he gives him a compliment, but not the true recognition of his actual person and his actual role. As a matter of fact, even Jesus points out this fact to him. You know, why refer to me as divine or good? You know, only God is good when you don't actually believe what you're actually saying to me. You know, you're, you're, you're giving me some sort of divine compliment here, but you don't, really, you don't really believe it. Why should you say that? He also thinks that Jesus is a man like himself, a great man, but a man nevertheless. He believes the only difference between them is some sort of secret some sort of knowledge that Jesus has that he doesn't have, and he'd like, you know, he'd like to know what Jesus knows. He also believes that eternal life can be obtained by a man from another man without the intervention of God. Because he only believes that Jesus is a man, and he figures that this man's going to tell him, just a man, exactly how to have this eternal life. In other words, God could tell us how to do it. You know, just like a, a secret or a rule to follow. And if he just tells us how to do it, we're, we're going to do it. Just tell me what I'm missing and I'll, you know, I'll take care of it. So the young ruler, like many today, he wanted the right thing and he's sincere about wanting it, but he doesn't see that faith in Jesus is the very first ingredient that's missing in the obtaining of this eternal life that he is, that he is seeking. You know, it all begins with Jesus as the Son of God. It all begins with acknowledging and, and, and recognizing and believing that He is the divine Messiah. That's the, act, that's the starting point. That's the, that's the thing that opens the door. That's the key. And He didn't, he didn't recognize this. Another thing missing is self-awareness. Self-awareness. His question, his response, his approach showed that he did not have a proper view of himself and his own true condition. You know, he was, he's not quite sure about himself. When he asks how to obtain eternal life, Jesus responds with what the young man had been taught and had tried without success. So right here we need a little background information to understand what's going on. Now, we're born, of course, and we are created to live forever. Our soul is eternal and God has programmed us to know this intuitively. We desire eternal life intuitively. Solomon says he has set eternity in their heart, Ecclesiastes 3.11. You know, in other words, we're pre-programmed to want to live eternally. Some people say pre-programmed to search for God, somehow the same you know, the same idea. The problem, of course, is sin, the breaking of God's laws, the disobedience to His word. When we sin, we're separated from God, we're denied our eternal life with Him, and yet our innate knowledge of how our own eternal nature yearns to be reunited with God. It's the thing a lot of people don't understand. You know, they have this thing, they have this angst, they go all over the world you know, to find themselves, to look for the thing, to find the truth, you know, and the truth is right there. They want to be united with God. They, they want to find again the intimacy that once man had with God. They're looking for that. They give it all kinds of names, but that's what the Bible describes it as. So the feeling of incompleteness, the dissatisfaction with this world, the pain of deep guilt and fear and dread of judgment, all these things stem from our desire to be united with God as we once were before sin. Now, there are two ways this reuniting with our eternal Father, this, this experiencing of eternal life can be accomplished. 
One way is, well, we never sin in the first place. We know that. I'm, I mean, I'm talking to the choir here, but I'm just setting this up to explain you know, the feeling of this young man here. Never sin in the first place. If, if one keeps perfectly all the commands of God, never violates his will or his word, then there is never any separation in the first place. That's one way to do it. The other way is to realize that we are sinners, that we are separated from God and subject to condemnation and accept God's gracious offer of forgiveness and restoration to unity and eternal life. In other words, the other way to be perfect, the other way to be reunited with God is through Christ, is through forgiveness. So either through perfection or through forgiveness. Those are the only two ways to find again that thing that, that we're looking for. Okay, so now back to our story with the, with the young uh, ruler. The young ruler understood that if one uh, never broke the law, they would experience eternal life and union with God. He understood that idea. He, for some reason or other, was under the impression that he had done this. <laughs> you know, he says to Jesus, I, you know, keep the commandments. And he says, well, I've done that. After all, when Jesus tells him that keeping the law will give him eternal life, he replies, well, I've tried to do that all my life. In his mind, he had done what a person had to do to gain this thing called eternal life, keep God's law. But here was the problem. He wasn't experiencing the promised results. He wasn't experiencing this, quote, eternal life. There wasn't a change somehow. Something was, something was missing. Something was left out. He had a, a missing ingredient and he thought perhaps Jesus could supply it. The secret, the thing, what is it? Tell me what it is. So the young man didn't see himself correctly. He didn't see what was obvious to Jesus. He didn't see that he was a sinner. He didn't see that he was a failure before God despite his wealth that he was a condemned man separated from God by sins. He didn't recognize the sins that he had committed even. He thought, you know, I'm okay with God and I don't understand why I'm not experiencing this eternal life thing. So this teacher here, this Jesus that everybody is talking about, maybe he's got the secret. Maybe he can tell me the thing that I need to do the thing that I need to have. Maybe he could just give me the thing that I can have so that I could have this, this missing ingredient, this eternal life. You know, intelligent, respectable, moral, successful people have always had a hard time recognizing that pride or greed or self-righteousness or worldliness or lack of faith will send you to hell as easily as murder and adultery and theft and you know, the more coarse, what I call the more coarse sins, you know? adultery, a coarse sin, C-O-A-R, you know, that coarse sin, a rough sin, murder, a rough sin, stealing, a rough sin. You know, that's what, pride, smooth sin, smooth sin. Greed, smooth sin. See what I'm saying? Rebelliousness, smooth sin. Sins that people don't always, don't always see. Model citizens need God's forgiveness just like everybody else. The Bible says that all are sinners and stand condemned. You know, the Queen of England, she needs Jesus Christ. You know, Brad Pitt, smooth, famous, good looking Brad Pitt, he, he, he needs Jesus Christ. Just like the guy who's coming out of McAllister after having served four and a half years for armed robbery with tattoos all over himself, he needs Jesus too. The thing that sometimes we don't realize is that both Brad Pitt 
and convict number A4932, you know, they both need, they both need Jesus Christ. The difference many times is that the convict more easily recognizes his need than the movie star. So the rich young ruler recognized that he had a deep need, but he didn't see that his need was for salvation through the mercy and forgiveness of God offered by the very person that stood right in front of him. The truth was that he was a sinner who needed grace, not a, not a saint who needed a, a secret method. A third ingredient, a third thing that is missing in this man is a changed, a changed heart. When Jesus said to this man, one thing you lack, he didn't mean that he had everything except one thing. This is what the young ruler thought. You know, he had it all and he was missing one last great secret that Jesus could give him and then he'd really have it all. In the Greek, this expression, you are behind one thing. In other words, it means you know, when, when Jesus says you're, you, you lack one thing, a better way of saying it is you're behind one thing. In other words, one thing is continually ahead of you. Despite what you have or what you don't have, there's one thing ahead of you that won't let you pass. You ever go to the airport, and you're walking along with your bags and you're, you're in a hurry to catch your flight and there's somebody right dead in the middle, two people walking together real slow and talking and carrying their bags and they got the kid on that side and a kid on that side and they're taking up the whole row and you're, you're you know, like this and you're trying to go this way and you're trying to go that way to get around them you know, and you're saying, would you just move over to one side? Well, it, that image there, that's what this expression means, one thing you lack. There's something ahead of you and you're trying to get ahead of it, but you, you can't get ahead of it. That's what Jesus is saying to him. For this man, his love and dependence on wealth was the thing that wouldn't let him pass. That was the thing that Jesus said to him. Your money, not just the amount of it, but how you feel about your wealth, that's the thing that's not letting you pass ahead to get to where you want to go. He could have had other sins. He could have had other faults as well, and surely he probably then. But the thing that was blocking his faith, the thing that was blocking his self-awareness, the thing that was blocking his repentance was his love of money. Whatever other faults he may have had, he could have gotten around those, but this one here was blocking the way. So Jesus explains to him how to overcome this sin, how to remove this obstacle by giving to others and then giving himself to the Lord. So for some, you know, the obstacle is what? Drugs? For others, sexual sin, pride, stubbornness, laziness. For each person, the answer is different in how to remove the obstacles to self-awareness, to faith. For this man, the problem was the love of and the dependence on wealth. How did he depend on wealth? I don't know, for his security perhaps, for his identity, for his position in society, Jesus was not making the giving away of one's wealth a condition of salvation. Because if he was, all of us, when we would become Christians, would have to give away everything. But that's not what he's doing here. He was removing the obstacle in this man's life so that this man could believe and repent and thus be saved. If we remember back to our own conversions, and this is the advantage, I think, of people who have become Christians as adults. Many times as an adult, you clearly remember the thing that was in front of you that you had to get past in order to get on to belief and conversion. When we do it as children, I still believe in the sincerity of children, but they don't have that same advantage 
as others who uh, are converted when they are uh, adult. And so the rich young ruler wanted treasure in heaven, but he didn't realize that it was his attitude towards his earthly treasure that was blocking the way. Jesus' invitation to follow him also revealed that the young man not only was unwilling to let go his wealth, he was also unwilling to let go his life to follow Jesus. And this was the basic reason that he was denied the thing that he, the thing that he wanted. You know, this episode um, sets up an opportunity for Jesus to teach the apostles about one of the great dangers in losing the kingdom. And we read this in verse 23, it says, And Jesus said to His disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So Jesus warns His apostles against worldliness, the enemy of the kingdom. The point Jesus makes is that the same one uh, uh, that He made in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 5.1. A man must enter heaven as a pauper, as a, as a baby, as a, as a poor sinner. You know, wealth has no value in the kingdom. Doesn't matter how rich you are, it has no, no value. Doesn't matter how good looking you are, it has no value. Doesn't matter who knows you or how important you are to the world, it has no value. I'm not saying it doesn't have value here on earth, but as far as the kingdom, the kingdom doesn't see this as something of value. A person trying to enter into the kingdom because of wealth or along with his wealth won't be able to do it. You know, you know, arguing the other side of it, just to make sure that we have a balanced view here. Job in the Bible, he was a rich man. Abraham was a rich man. David, Solomon, they were rich men. Matthew was a rich man. Lydia, she was rich. All of them were rich and faithful. I've known rich people in the church personally, very wealthy millionaires in the church who themselves were extremely wealthy and, and who were also extremely faithful, one doesn't necessarily you know, remove the other. Being rich and successful doesn't stop you from being part of the kingdom, but it can be a dangerous obstacle if you place it before the kingdom. I think that's an obvious lesson here. Very few people can be both very rich and very spiritual because what creates one wars against the other. It requires someone of tremendous maturity spiritually to be able to handle great physical wealth while practicing uh, you know, Christian uh, spirituality or being in the kingdom and being functioning in the kingdom. It requires great maturity. I've always been very in great admiration of the individuals that I've known who were wealthy and at the same time very, very active in the Lord's church. You know, I've known uh, you know, doctors and, and others, lawyers and so on and so forth who were extremely wealthy but who served as elders and who were very effective as elders in the church. I've known women extremely wealthy, extremely wealthy in the church and, and, but who served as the director of the nursery. You know, here's a woman who could hire someone to do that. 12 months out of the year without putting a dent in her pocketbook. And yet she herself chose to be the one who organized the nursery and not a nursery like a small one like we have here. The church where these individuals went was a church of 1,500 to 2,000 people. There were hundreds of children in the nursery and she, she, was, she found the volunteers and she did this and so on and so forth. I don't want, her, I don't want to mention her name. Some of you may know her so I want to maintain her privacy. The only thing I want to say publicly is how much I admired her, her deep, deep commitment to service. 
Peter and the apostles were having trouble with this idea because like most Jews of those days, they believed that being wealthy was a sign that God was pleased with you. In other words, your wealth was a sign of God's favor on you. And Jesus clarifies this idea and he reassures that with faith, men can be saved. You know, these rich people that I know, the thing that saves them is the same thing that saved me, faith in Jesus Christ. In other words, they're saying, the apostles were saying, well, if the wealthy who are favored by God are in danger of losing their salvation, what chance do we poor people have? That's the, that's the question Peter is asking. And Jesus tells them that with or without money, men do not have the ability to save themselves. Only God can do this. And He does it based on faith, not money. And that's what levels the playing field. You know, Bill and I are getting the same reward, even though he's lived as a Christian much longer than I have. And so we go to verse 27, 30, finish out the passage here. Then Peter said to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you also shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So Peter follows up the previous discussion with a question based on what he had heard and seen with Jesus and the rich young ruler. This fellow had chosen not to follow Jesus and left, but he still had his money and his prestige and his wealthy lifestyle. Peter says, we on the other hand, we've left everything to follow. Where's our reward? You know, Peter's speaking the mind of the others in saying that they had made the right choice, but unlike the wealthy ruler, they were still poor. They were still rejected. Where's our part? Where's our share? This guy doesn't even want to follow you. And he goes you know, with his attendants and you know, he goes back to his wealth. So Jesus' answer describes for the first time the blessings that the king will bestow on those who enter the kingdom by faith. First of all, he says in the kingdom, they will be at the seat of authority with God. Judging the 12 tribes you know, was the highest authority and power position that they could imagine. Jesus has not yet described the advantages of the kingdom in, a, in an oblique way he has. You know, Sermon on the Mount, you have to kind of discern what that means. But here he's, he's much clearer about what they're going to get. Secondly, he lists the blessings of the here and now. You know, he talks about family and possessions, you know, those who have this and this and who have left all these things to follow me. Those things are blessings, aren't they? Family and possessions and businesses and friendships and all, those are blessings. But he says in the kingdom, the blessings will be of a better kind. Peace, righteousness, freedom from the fear of death, fellowship with the saints, intimacy with God, knowledge of God's will. All of these things are blessings that are greater in their intensity, in their value, than the blessings of wealth and family and homes and businesses. Yes, those things are blessings under the sun, as Solomon would say. There certainly are blessings here on earth and there are people that seek only these kinds of blessings. Jesus is saying those in the kingdom will have better blessings, not the same kind, but better blessings. And then thirdly, he says those in the kingdom can look forward to the resurrection and eternal life in heaven. I mean, the only thing the wealthy man can look forward to is hanging on to his wealth until he dies. That's it. Nothing comes after that. But for the one in the kingdom, Jesus says, no matter what you have here on earth, what you're looking forward to is much greater than what the wealthy man here on earth is looking forward to. 
So Jesus' final statement summarizes the situation in the present and in the future. He says, some who are first now, those with wealth and position and power, they will be of no consequence at the judgment because they are missing what is most important, and that is faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the question, you know, the judgment, you know, the judgment is, you ready for the judgment? You want, let's, let's have a preview of the judgment, shall we? Would you like to have a preview of the judgment right now? Just make sure that you're ready. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yeah, that was a very loud amen. I don't think the microphone picked it up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes, I do, that's it. Okay, no judgment for you. You guys stand over here. That's the judgment. Not, did you perform perfectly? That's, that's not a question that you, have to, that you have to answer. So some, some who are first now, they'll be last because they won't be able to answer that question correctly. And then some who are last now, the poor, the ordinary, the powerless, they'll be first in rank when Jesus comes. Why? Because he said they'll be seated with Christ on the heavenly throne because of what they have found and what they have kept here. And what they have found and kept here is faith in Jesus Christ. Lack of faith is one person's loss of the kingdom, another's belief brings rewards beyond expectation. You know, I've often thought that the rich young ruler, and it's easy to surmise and to guess, and this is only what this is, you know, just a guess, just a, me surmising, but I think he could have been one of the, one of the apostles. You know, Jesus said, come, follow me. A personal, imagine a personal invitation from the Lord. He said that to Matthew, didn't he? And Matthew followed. He said, you, Peter, you know, you come, follow me. It was the, it was the term that he used to, to gather his apostles. Could have been one of his apostles. One of the sad, sad stories of the New Testament. Okay, well that's our lesson and that's our video class in Matthew, lesson number nine. Thank you for your attention.